This is the Brewer to Brewer podcast from All About Beer, a conversation that goes beyond the brew house and into topics that matter to professional brewers and curious beer drinkers. Visit allaboutbeer.com and follow on social media. And to support journalism in the beer space, check out patreon.com backslash allaboutbeer. Hello, everyone. I'm Tommy Arthur of The Lost Abbey. And this week, I'm glad to be talking with my friend Marcus Baskerville of Weathered Souls. We'll get into that in just a moment. But first, this message. First Tea is a proud sponsor of the Brewer to Brewer podcast. They've been working with brewers on a wide range of ingredients and delicious beers. First Tea combines the flexibility of order sizes with the experience you need to create innovative and successful tea beers. They get you the most direct from farm tea selection, so you are working with flavorful and consistent products. You can find more about First Tea's collaborations with brewers and tea ingredients by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.firsdtea.com. Marcus, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic, here. So, looks like you uh, probably are starting to uh, have a hot San Antonio uh, summer. Is that what the uh, outfit uh, represents we're at, today? We're at 50, 50 something days of 100 plus. Man alive. So how's, how's the cold box feel? Uh, it's been absolutely ridiculous out here. And then yeah. um, we're, I know, huh? cold box is a wonderful thing during the summer. It's like sometimes it's been, it's felt better in the cold box than like, man, it's, it's refreshing for sure. Yeah. And then outside of that, you know, gearing up, uh, we had that extensive week of events this week. So been putting in a lot of time towards that the last couple of weeks and been it's been okay so far so when do you get back to uh, california sacramento in a little bit better weather um so i just had to cancel a trip uh, i was actually supposed to be in uh norcal last week uh, to brew with alvarado street and humble sea uh, but i recently had a brewer uh quit on us and so put me back in the brew floor and i would have felt bad if i was on the beach golfing in <laughs> monterey <laughs> While my while my few employees were here slaving away, so that, that is the, I had to that is the, that trip. Yeah, that is the concern of being in charge, huh? All right. Yeah. Well, what kind of leader would I have been if I was on the beach golfing and they were here struggling to get ready for for the week of event? So I said, let me put my my boss hat on and get to work. Well, it sounds like you did the right thing. I got about 10 questions, maybe a few more for you today. So I thought I'd uh, kind of get into them, but uh, there's a whole, they go in all kinds of directions, but it should be pretty cool. And some of these things I don't actually know the answers to. So uh, let's get this seriously easy question. Number one out of the way, who is Marcus Baskerville and how did you get here today? Also, are you drinking anything right now? Yeah. Um, so me, Marcus Baskerville, um, I am originally a rancher Cordova native, uh, born and raised. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, it's kind of a little subsidiary of Sacramento. Um, let's see, I got into beer, um, it seems like forever ago, but really not that long ago, about 2008, 2009 time frame. Um, got introduced to it through some relatives and, you know, a couple little things I enjoyed, a couple little things not so much, um, especially because I come from like a super like cocktail liquor background. I was more so in the drinking Hennessy and and some rock and stuff like that versus beer. And then even then when I was around beer, you know, it was river beers. Uh, For those unfamiliar with Northern California, we have a lot of rivers and we do a lot of floating during the summer and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of things like Natty Light, Bud Light, those types of beers. And I really didn't gravitate towards those. Um, In 2013, I had the opportunity to move to San Antonio um, from, Sacramento area and there kind of increased my home brewing. I got in a car accident and my job was one mile away from where I was living at the time. And I said, you know what? I'd rather spend money on home brewing equipment than fix my car. So got some upgraded home brewing equipment and kind of got to work. Um, me as a person, I guess, um, really I'm very prideful, I'm competitive. Um, very dry in a sense and very straightforward um, for those that know me. Um, but one thing is um, I'm a very loyal person and support my friends and, you know, a uh, big family man. I have two kids and um, 
you know, I come from a very uh, family oriented background. My parents have been married for over 40 years. Um, and so that's one of those type of morale things that are kind of bestowed within you in a sense. Um, so being a big family person, um, you know, being in Texas has obviously made that a little bit difficult in a sense because I don't get to see him that often. Um, but outside of that, yeah, that's kind of who I am as a person. Right now, what I'm drinking is coffee. I'm on 60 plus hours of work currently this week and still have two more events to go. Um, and so I've crafted my own Mexican hot chocolate nitro cold brew at Starbucks. And so I drink those about once a day <laughs> for like the last week. Those require extra time on the Peloton? Um, actually, I haven't been on the bike lately. I've been running uh, yeah. more. Um, I ended up getting a really bad sinus infection like two months ago and it completely derailed my fitness for a couple of weeks. And so when I finally got back on it, uh, we hosted a 5K event for the brewery. And so I participated, did okay, and it motivated me to want to start running more. Um, and so, yeah, I put in probably typically a good 20, 25 miles a week now running versus the bike, uh, trying to supplement the bike every once in a while, but I really need to get back on it. I've been slacking quite a bit. Did I see you, you ran see. some, yeah, you ran some kind of long distance or almost an hour the other day, something continuously. Yeah, uh, really, yeah, yeah. like continuously ran for a little over 30 minutes. Uh, being that I haven't been a real runner since high school, since sports and stuff like that. Uh, mind you, I'm an avid weed smoker. I didn't really feel like I would be able to do it, but it worked out. So um, it kind of motivated me to want to start running more. Um, we'll, we'll run a couple more 5Ks and then kind of rush up to a 10K. Uh, I forgot who it was. Somebody recently asked me to do a half marathon with him. I'm like, ah, I'm nowhere near that yet. But we'll see what happens. I, I have one in my one in my back pocket, and that's probably the last one I'm ever doing. It was a lot of, <laughs> it was a lot of training, and uh, boy, it's thirteen point two, thirteen point one is a long ways to go. So, but yeah. you do a lot of outside biking, right? Yeah, I cycle quite a bit. I'm trying to get back into yeah. it. It's funny you're talking about the weather yesterday. It was about eighty five degrees here, and the humidity was up, so it was pretty brutal. It was a pretty brutal lunch ride yesterday. I still regret not moving to San Diego. I was supposed to move to San Diego when I was nineteen years old, and the traffic was just so bad that it derailed me from wanting to move there. And then one of my friends that I was going to move with moved like a couple months later and I have regretted it ever since. San Diego is my all time favorite, favorite place. Well, it's a great place to raise the kids. So you just figure out how to get your butt here. Let's right. talk about the weathered soul side of things. Uh, talk about like how weathered souls came to be. And I'm really curious as to the naming choice and how you guys kind of settled in on that. Yeah, uh, Weathered Souls. So originally when I first started getting engulfed into like the San Antonio culture of beer, um, I started bringing beers to a lot of different bars, restaurants, breweries, different little things like that. Um, one of the things that set me off apart from the very jump was here is, you know, it's, it was always more of those traditional German style, uh, maltier Ford beers and different things like that. Um, but obviously coming from that California background, we're used to the West Coast IPAs, AZs were starting to uh, become a little more popular in that area, the big boy stout, sours and stuff like that. And so those were the things that I wanted to homebrew um, and took to homebrewing very well. Uh, won a couple of awards early on and started bringing you know, beers around for people to try. And so this local brewery, called Busted Sandals, they had let me do a tap takeover. And I went ahead and um, I think it was three beers and all three of them sold out that night. So then they ended up offering me a job like a week or two later as an assistant brewer. So I worked there for about a year learning the do's and don'ts of brewing. More so the don'ts. Um, but being one of the, you know, being the type of person that I am, I, I grew unhappy very early on. I mean, and it's typical of what the beer scene is, right? When you come in as an assistant brewer, you're doing a lot of cleaning, you're doing a lot of maintenance, you're, you're an assistant. But that wasn't enough for me. I wanted to produce my own beers. I wanted to, you know, brew. And I was having those opportunities. I mean, <laughs> so there, to this day, they had this beer called Lafitte. And it was this brown ale that ended up getting messed up, but I ended up doing some adjunct treatments on it. 
And I remember the guidelines of what they gave me as far as the adjuncts that I could use. And I went ahead and skipped that entire. And I just added what I wanted. And it's still their highest rated beer to this day. But what was in it? My point it was Lafitte. So we ended up adding vanilla beans, uh, cacao nibs, and I forgot what the other adjunct was. But whatever they gave me, I ended up quadrupling the <laughs> and never told anybody until the owner was talking about, you know, like how beer, the, the, how good the beer was. And then I was like, well, you know, we kind of changed up some things. And he was really pissed about it. I can imagine so, you couldn't pay for all that stuff, right? That, that junk's are expensive. <laughs> Four right? times. But it was it was an amazing beer. And people still talk about it. Mind you, this was seven years ago. Um, and so at one point, I grew unhappy. Uh, didn't really have the opportunity to do the things that I wanted to do. Didn't have the opportunity to grow as a brewer. Didn't have the opportunity to be who I am as a person, right? You're over here conformed to what this brewery wants, the beers that they're they're producing. And in all honesty, I was working there to gain knowledge. I didn't even personally really like the beers that we were producing. So to have that in the back of your mind, it's like, okay, is this really what you want to do? Um, at one point, me and the owner ended up having a little back and forth for him blaming me and this other assistant on something that we actually didn't do. Um, one of the things that I mentioned before is I'm a very prideful individual. So when this owner was mad about the situation, instead of speaking to us with respect, he basically told us that uh, we needed to learn how to be men and take responsibility for our actions. And it was like, wait a second, well, I already told you that I didn't make this action, so what is there to take responsibility for? But even then, now you're questioning me as a man. I don't even let my dad talk to me like that. So now either we're going to have to go fist to cuss or I'm going to have to quit. So, <laughs> I don't remember you being arrested for hitting anyone. So exactly. So I ended up quitting, and within that time frame, uh, me and Mike had became friends, which is my business partner. Uh, Mike was invested in the previous brewery that I was working for. We used to go out, drink, hang out, that type of thing. And um, we were out about a week after I quit busted sandal, and I go, "When are we going to open a brewery?" And his response, he looks at me and he goes, I've been waiting for you to ask me that. Hmm. And we started working on the business plan eight days later. So what, um, what time frame is that? Like, where does that put you? This is 2000, early 2015. What kind of breweries were in town at that point? Uh, the most popular brewery at that point probably would have been Freetail. So okay. a lot of um, traditional beers in a sense, a lot of German inspired beers in a sense. And so when we opened well even then before we opened we started doing sensory programs and hosting events and letting people try some of the different things that we were producing and it went really well with the local community i mean we were the first brewery in san antonio to produce hazy ipas we we're the first brewery in san antonio to do a real west coast ipa i mean we we're the first brewery in san antonio to do adjunct barrel aged stouts first brewery to do you know the heavily fruited sours all those things that those consumers to enjoy but then we also have a traditional sense to us because for me as a brewer yes we make a lot of the things that these people enjoy but i still enjoy traditional things i mean i think i think right now we currently have about six loggers on top um but meeting mike uh we get, got into a plan we brought on another individual the one that also got blamed for the issue at the other brewery um he ended up quitting and joining in I was still working full time at Citibank at the time as a fraud manager with 28 employees and basically would work my nine to five and then come in in the evening, we'd do construction, get things situated for the brewery. And then Mike and, and Seth would work during the day. Um, so it was about an eight, nine month process for us to open the brewery. Um, the name was the hardest thing for us. We played with so many different ideas as far as what we wanted to do for our name. And we even hired um, you know, companies to help us with it and different things like that. And we couldn't land on anything that was meaningful to us. Um, so Mike one night had emailed me and he was talking about uh, how he liked dealing with um, ships, how they refer to bodies on ships as souls. So not individual people, different things like that. It brings kind of more of a meaningful nature to 
the 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 people that are on on the boat ship instead of burning them as bodies or whatever, but souls. Um, and then the weathered aspect actually came from dealing with his uh, father and grandfather. They used to do uh, milk trucks back in the day, and just having that growth of moving through life and kind of becoming more of that weathered figure. Um, for me, it resonated because I've been in so many different um, kind of fields of, of business over the course of, mind you, I'm only 37, but, you know, I've been an underwriter, I've done banking, I've been a fraud manager, I used to write fraud policies. At one point, I've worked for Verizon, you know, all of these different things, but none of these things that I ever think would lead me into the direction of being. Beer didn't, wasn't anything that was ever in my mindset as far as what my life was going to end up being. Um, even when I first started drinking beer, it wasn't anything that was kind of in that mindset. Um, one of the more main focuses when I first got into beer was noticing the lack of diversity. And that was something that we really pushed for when I first started drinking beer, was starting Brothers of Beer with my cousin and my brother. And that, you know, has even transcended on to this point to where there's this huge Facebook group that has a few thousand um, Black members and, and different things like that. But that was all based off of the nature of what we noticed that the beer scene was back in 2009, 2010. Um, and so for me, dealing with that and not really realizing that beer was in, I guess, my future um, kind of made everything go full circle. And what really hit me when I wanted to start producing beer was when I was homebrewing and noticing that a lot of the beer that I was homebrewing was better than the beer that was being served here locally. And then that's what actually really, really motivated me to want to, to actually start producing beer. But then the other thing was, is the pride nature that I have. And the fact that there weren't, or and I'm not going to say aren't, but are very little renowned Black brewers in this industry. And that was something that just nitpicked at me for so long. And it was like, well, if all of these fine um, white folks can do it, then I can do it too. So it's and a little arrogant, what, no? It's a little arrogant to suggest that you could just jump in and become a world-class brewer, right? No matter what your oh, color? Definitely so. Definitely right. so. And I it like wasn't that. necessarily, yeah, it wasn't necessarily the fact of, of arrogance, but it was seeing so many people become successful and having this, this pride in what they were doing and making amazing beer. And it's like, okay, I understand that beer historically hasn't really been geared towards minorities, but if all these people are around and being able to produce this and do these things, why can't I do it too? So and why can't I change the dynamics of what we see and the dynamics of what's around us? And that was what really drove me to want to become a not only a brewer, but a good brewer. So I, I know there's this deep love for for Kobe and the whole Mamba. Like, do you think that part of that swagger in your in your world comes from sort of that sense of like, if you want it, you got to go get it kind of thing? Like, oh, 100 percent. And then that's another thing with what's interesting. Uh, and that's a good point. So Kobe for me is very mean since that. Um, I used to hoop in Kobe's in high school. I broke my ankle in a pair of Kobe Bryant's in his Adidas sneakers. And I vowed off Kobe Bryant. I am not supporting this man ever again. He ruined my basketball career, that type of thing. You know, like I, I can't support Kobe Bryant any longer. And Kobe's drive and what he did for the Lakers and bringing those extra two championships is what made me a fan all over again. And having somebody that has that nature of that killer mentality and doing whatever is necessary to win is something that really motivates me and is really meaningful to me. And I think a lot of people don't forget that a lot of cultures are, are different in a sense, right? Uh, when it comes to Black culture, we've always had that kind of crab in a barrel mentality because systemically that's what's been set for us which is a whole nother conversation but 
you have this chip on your shoulder when you enter certain things and certain modes and you have to be the best at what you do and you have to be successful and you know all of these things factor in to that and so for me not only is beer a career not only is beer a passion but again i have a competitive nature so of course i want to make amazing products i want to have a successful business but if I do that, I also want to be recognized for the things that I'm doing. I also want to be, you know, somebody who they speak your name and when they do, it's something positive in that sense. And that's always been something that's kind of been at the back of my head brewing wise, you know, like, and it's funny because I just had uh, one of our old brewers come in and, uh, you know, to the, to the benefit of John Hall and, and all the other writers, we just got put into uh, the the World Greatest Beers book. And so when I had mentioned it to the old, because he was part of the original Black is Beautiful Brew Day, he was like, ah, uh, he was like, I know that uh, had to be meaningful, but he was like, man, you're just, you're always chasing, uh, always chasing that clout. And I'm like, it, <laughs> it resonated with me because I was like, you know what, he's not wrong. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I mean, it hasn't been a bad thing for me thus, thus far. So sure. why not do you, continue? Do you, right? do you think the invitation to the one named Brewers Club is coming? I doubt it, but we'll see. <laughs> There's certainly room. There is no Marcus currently in the one in the one name uh, Brewers Club. So maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe that invitation's in the mail. Right. All right. So I have a question for you. It kind of goes back to being um, African American in, in this kind of universe, and I, I you. I find it very interesting because you had made a post earlier in the year about coming home and being close to your house. And I believe a police officer pulled you over for not making a turn turn signal or something close to home. And while we're in the beer space, this is a totally unique thing to a black male. And I think it's really worth telling the story because to me, it was fascinating to read it. So can you just share with yeah, us I mean, what that was? What that was? Yeah, it's, it's crazy because we've been having a lot of, so we live on the West side of town, West side of town, from San Antonio is kind of the like, Hood scene. Now we don't live in a hood neighborhood. It's like one of those situations where you live outside of the hood, but you're still pretty close. But the hood has started to filter in into these neighborhoods. And so um, yeah, like I'm literally the stop sign is two houses away from me. So stop sign, my house or neighbor's house, neighbor's house, my house. Cop isn't even behind me. He's just parked on the side of the street at the stop sign is a turnaround so it's not even like you could just go straight so really the only direction unless i live in a house to the right is to go left which is a, a through street so mind you i'm two houses away go ahead make that turn fully stop at the stop sign that wasn't the issue fully stop at the stop sign make my turn cop ends up pulling me over literally in front of my house so first thing i do obviously is turn on the camera on my phone and I open my garage and put my hands on the steering wheel. So officer, you know, comes up. Hey, uh, you didn't use your turn signal, officer. I'm two houses away from the stop sign. And even then I have to turn left. And on top of that, there were nobody behind me. Like there were no cars behind me. Well, I was behind you. No, technically you're pulled over to the side of the street. But he didn't even ticket me. The problem was he was profiled because of these issues that have been going on in the neighborhoods, I don't look like the type that lives in this neighborhood. And so you know that he's really not pulling you over for not using that turn signal. He's pulling you over to find something wrong. So he runs all my information, that type of thing. Mind you, I can still carry now, but we can do that in Texas. And then he gives me like one of those little warning papers and sends me on my way. But it's the fact that we still have to go through those situations in my own neighborhood, two houses away that I get pulled over for something that the normal individual would not get pulled over for if they were in that situation. If I remember so, correctly, you were really frustrated and really kind of put back by that whole sense of this is the world we still live in kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy that we still have to be on high alert of just a general 
traffic thing like, hey, I'm making a left. I can't make a right. <laughs> There's nobody behind me. But let me use my traffic sign for or traffic signal for a ghost just so I don't have the opportunity to get pulled over. So it is very frustrating and deflating that we're still kind of at this point within, you know, our country that we have to be on such high alert for everything. And then the fact that I have to turn on my camera and record the conversation just in the sense that I don't even know if I'm going to make it to my garage because these cops have the issue. And then his initial response, you know, as is confrontational. It's not even like just having a conversation. Why are you starting off the conversation confrontational? I'm not being confrontational with you. I'm not like, why did you pull me over? So if I'm not presenting that same energy, why present that energy to me unless you're trying to cause the issue? I mean, on some levels, you know, some people don't make it to the garage, right? That's that's been a that's been a reality. And that's kind of what I and that too. The take away from from your kind of expression was, you know, I'm lucky to have made it to my garage, right? Pretty much. Crazy. All right. So I have a few great questions to come back to, but I think we should take a little break right here. Um, so if we could hold on for just a couple of minutes, if you're with us, there's some cool things coming out of the break. Um, just a quick, quick moment to uh, check up and uh, let our sponsors uh, get their message in and we'll be right back. First Tea is a proud sponsor of the Brewer to Brewer podcast. They've been working with brewers on a wide range of ingredients and delicious beers. First Tea combines the flexibility of order sizes with the experience you need to create innovative and successful tea beers. They get you the most direct from farm tea selection, so you are working with flavorful and consistent products. You can find more about First Tea's collaborations with brewers and tea ingredients by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.firsttea.com. Marcus, I think Black is Beautiful was an absolute runaway success, and I think everybody knows that. It's kind of one of those things that that will absolutely define uh, a lot of your career and your legacy. And given the conversation that we just had about being a Black man in a, in a neighborhood and being pulled over, it has to kind of set the tone for why you created that project. So give us a really strong sense of the emotion and just how it came to be. But I really want you to tell us I want to hear a story about it that maybe hasn't been talked about or something um, that you really kind of took away from that. Maybe it's a, a specific brewery or someone who did something or the, the, just the, the general, like, give us a, a really strong sense of why that thing matters so much to you. Yeah. Um, well, I've talked about this on Facebook before. Um, I've had some negative experiences as a youth dealing with the police and stuff like that. Mind you, I come from a very uh, heavily law enforcement house. Dad's in law enforcement, brothers in law enforcement, uh, multiple relatives in law enforcement and things like that. But have had some negative, very negative experiences when it comes to law enforcement. Um, and so we look back where we were at 2020 and I was on my way to Dallas and was listening to The Breakfast Club and was listening to Brianna Taylor's mom talk. And she was just speaking about the actions of the course of actions of her finding out how her daughter was murdered and how the police basically strung her around for multiple hours and hours and hours until she finally found out what happened. And that conversation brought me to tears, just listening to it. One, because it makes you think about the situations that you've been in. But then on the other end of it, like I'm raising young daughters myself. And so to think about the direction that our country still is in and kind of going in, um, you look at it and it's a disheartening thing. Like you, you lose faith in humanity and kind of what's, what's to come. And so it's funny because people always talk about, or a few people have talked about, you know, the unorganization of Black is Beautiful. But what people don't realize about Black is Beautiful is that that was completely a 100% organic thing that was driven based off of emotion. It was literally listening to a conversation, then having a conversation with uh, Jeffrey Stephens from Jester King, and then being like, man, I need to do something. I need to do something to give back. We're in peak 2020, and I just looked at myself like you're a disappointment because you have all of these protests going on we're basically in like civil rights 2.0 and your ass is sitting at home basically doing nothing yes you you chat a lot on facebook about the the discrepancies and and things like that 
but I've always been more of an action drives more than talk type of person. So unless you're actually providing action, you're not doing anything. And then I looked at what my daughters would say about me, right? Now say the, the course of actions in 2020 had extended longer and they would have looked back at the course of history, like what was daddy doing at this time? Oh, he was just at the house with us. And I couldn't let that happen. So me being the introverted individual that I am and we being peak COVID, I wasn't going to those protests. But how can I give back within the opportunities that I have? How can I give back based off of what I have at the forefront at that time? And it was beer. And so that's how Black is Beautiful came along. And originally it was gonna be a standalone release. I was gonna do it in the brewery, um, release, you know, some proceeds to a local charity, but it was about that that giving solidarity to the cause of what was going on at that time. But then having the conversation with Jeff and him challenging me to take it a step further is what made me go ahead and do the initiative and you can tell the tone of what our industry is is when even how jeff worded it to me he was like i would understand if you don't want to but you should turn this into a collaboration and that just that sentence right there tells you where kind of the the general consensus of where our industry was at that time you know, like, do you really want to go through the troubles of, of doing this? But I think it's something that could be great. And so I thought about it over the course of that 24 hours, like, how could I? And what was hard for me was the fact that we're at 9,000 breweries, right? Well, you figure 8,900 and some change of those are Caucasian owned breweries. And here I am asking these 9,000 breweries to go ahead and produce a beer called Black is Beautiful and then engage into conversation, engage into um, wanting to help your diverse communities and then give money and proceeds back. But not only that, but the long term. So take it a step further and continue to do these things to build up your communities. And we know that the brewing industry has the opportunity to be very diverse and has the opportunity to be very inclusive, but we're not there yet. And so I look at Black is Beautiful two ways. I find that, yes, it was very successful in the sense that uh, the amount of money that was raised, I mean, it was you know close to $4 million. Um, it helped out a ton of different organizations, a ton of different, um, foundations and things of that such. But again, we have 9,000 breweries in the United States and we had 1,400 participate. So even then that's still a, what is that? 7,600 breweries that didn't have anything to do with that initiative or Black is Beautiful or whatever the case may be. And mind you, we're in peak COVID. So those breweries that didn't do it because of the financial concerns and different things like that, I guess you can use that as somewhat of an excuse but we also know that there were a lot of vendors, a lot of businesses that were giving free uh, ingredients and um, a lot of heavy discounts to kind of compensate some of that. And so I don't really take that excuse too much. I kind of, you know, roll my eyes when people give that excuse, but I guess it's an excuse. So I see it from two separate ends that, yes, it was a wonderful thing that we had 1,400 breweries participate in this and and we did a, a huge thing it had international attention. That's amazing. But we still had 7,600 breweries that didn't participate. So to me, in that sense, we still have a long ways to go as an industry um, as far as what we see as diverse and what we see as inclusive. And I mean, you know, Tommy, because we're on the board, we deal with these conversations daily. Um, and then deal with them in the meetings and dealing with the DEI stuff. And that Dr. J thing always rings in the back of my head. You know, you wouldn't need a DEI committee. You wouldn't need to make sure you're talking about DEI if that was already included in your culture of who you are. 
Sure. And so the fact that we have to have these discussions, we have to have these trainings, you know, we have to have these different groups within different guilds and, you know, businesses having to bring in DEI uh, people to talk to their staff. It's a great thing that we're doing it, but it's terrible that it's necessary. It's a very odd sense of how to how to accomplish something, you know, how to change the culture, right? And so, you know, um, dealing with Black is Beautiful and people are still brewing the beer. People are still doing amazing things with it. But then also, again, I'm a competitive person. And so dealing with that, you know, Black is Beautiful was stagnant. I mean, you're not having continual breweries of the 1400s and, you know, all of that kind of uh, continue. And I didn't want the motivation behind it to die. I didn't want the all of the things that it did accomplish to die just because you know over the course of time things have slowed down and you know that's why we're doing the incubation program in charlotte it's kind of the next transition up from black is beautiful and kind of what i can continue to provide to the industry um you know based off of what i'm able to do anyway and so it's funny i was on a peloton ride and i was riding to two day and Tuesday talked about passion and purpose and how your passion isn't always your purpose and your purpose isn't always your passion. And it resonated with me because DEI work, social justice work, uh, being the forefront of a, a international initiative, those were never things, again, just like brewing that I never had in my thought process. Um, you know, I've always been a supporter of diversity, again, and always been a supporter of bringing more women, bringing more Black people into beer since I've been in it, but I never wanted to be the spokesperson for it. And I realized that even though that's not what I wanted, it has become my purpose. And if I could be in a position to provide people like my that look like me that didn't have the same opportunities as I had to get into the industry because I had it pretty easy compared to a lot of people that look like me in the industry. I didn't have to worry about financing and all of that type of stuff. Uh, my business partner, Mike, truly blessed me with what I have here at Weathered Souls. And so a lot of people like me don't have those opportunities to be able to say, hey, when are we going to open a brewery? Let's get to work. Like, that doesn't happen. And so... I've looked at that it's become my purpose to be able to be that individual that provides for other people of likeness culture. So based off of Black is Beautiful, I've been able to build up all of these relationships, you know, with Brar, with uh, Yakamichi, with White Labs and places like that. And some people don't have these relationships. And so if I'm able to go and ask and say, hey, Rar, can you assist me with, you know, creating an educational program for Malting and then donating $100,000 towards the program and they do this, then it might not be what I want to do with my time, but it's, it's needed and I'm here to do it. And, you know, I've, I've found that this within the industry, not only trying to produce fantastic beer, my other purpose here is to drive diversity and create change within this industry. So you and I were lucky enough to spend the early part of June in Washington, DC. And there was a very specific thing um, that happened in Washington, DC with regards to the Supreme Court. And at the exact same time that we were there doing our messaging mm -hmm. and, and stuff for the BA, you also got to go hang out and go to the exhibit at the Smithsonian, right? Uh, so how crazy was it to be there for black is beautiful and at the same time to see this other landmark civil rights ish kind of thing right personal liberties going on i mean it's such a clash right i guess the takeaway is, yeah. is you you went on thursday to the museum right and then friday mm -hmm. was the, the decision yeah, like friday was the row versus mm -hmm. wade stuff just yeah. ex just give me the experience of what that meant like it's like the, the high and the low or what what did that what did that yeah, look yeah. like it's interesting so to be able to see myself in American history and see all it, and it's not just myself, it's all the work that my staff put in, um, you know, my sales Let me, let me jump in real quick. Tell people what this exhibit, what it, what was in it, right? Like explain yeah, what yeah. you went to go see. Yeah, so 
Uh, Black is Beautiful was submitted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Library. And on the fourth floor, they have a display uh, with a quote of myself, uh, what Black is Beautiful is about, and a can from one of the local DC uh, breweries that produced the beer. And so to be able to see that in a quote from myself in American history and Black American history at that, this is something that is always going to be there. Like, it literally brought me to tears. And this goes back to the conversation I had with about my children and what was daddy doing at this time this is something that they'll be able to see for the rest of their life and tell their kids that hey my daddy was doing this during this time and he accomplished this and it brought me to tears like i'm not gonna even lie just to sit there and i sat there and just sat in front of that uh exhibit probably for a good 30 45 minutes just to kind of like soak in that whole experience and then what was also crazy was on one of the other displays, um, they were having uh, some like uh, voiceovers for people about their experience of finding out when Martin Luther King died. And I had a relative who was one of the people whose voices were in there as well. And we're on the same floor. And so just to be able to see that, that was absolutely insane. But then as we were talking about kind of seeing how our culture and how the course of America is going right now and the direction is going, it's scary. And the fact that we have something like that reversed and women don't have the say to do what they want with their bodies regardless is absolutely insane. And we look at what kind of potential if they are going to do things like that what else other trickle effects can happen, right? Uh, there, there, we've already seen senators. I think there was a, se a Texas senator that was talking about um, a couple of things uh, related to Jim Crow and different things like that. And so to see us go back in that kind of direction is a super scary thing. But then also to go from kind of that joy of accomplishment to the anger, like, man, there's still so much work to do in our country. Um, was a huge conundrum for me. Um, and then especially the fact, again, I'm raising daughters, and I'm especially being in Texas and, you know, looking at the negative experiences that they can have based off of decisions that people who don't even have these bodies are making is, is insane to me. And, you know, hopefully... Hopefully we can or don't continue to go down. I, I pray that we don't continue to go down, you know, but it's not looking good. So you and I had a very great conversation about legacies and things. And I, I told you that with all the, the great landscape beer things that I've managed to accomplish in my time, and it's been I, nothing I've done in beer or ever connect the way that black is beautiful and, and resonate and your legacy and, and being in the museum and being a black man. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like to take your daughters and be like, this is my display. As much as you were overwhelmed the first time, I think it might even be, be stronger to, to, you know, to connect them to that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's incredible. And I think that's just something that, that you, even at this age, get to take away for the rest of your life. And you're not done. That, I think that's the biggest message for me is that you've only been doing this for 10 years and, and now you know you're you've already set yourself up for the for the long haul i, I have a really interesting question for you because i i, I do i don't stock but i want to i want to talk about something more enlightening and maybe something a little more fun so um mm -hmm. you seem to have had a really bad run with the earth let's talk about like what the f your travel's been like right every time i turn around you're, you're getting <laughs> you're getting bombed by the airlines in some bad way so let's relate to the people over over bad flight schedules man it's been crazy and no and it's funny because nobody like really believes me that i have all of these issues with these flights it it was like a course of eight flights in a row and these are round trip like eight round trip flights in a row every single flight i had an issue whether it be cancellation delay um you know you get on the plane and then there's a mechanical issue you know whatever the case may be it was absolutely insane and I had uh, one of my local members uh, fly with me to uh, Miami for Wake Fest this year. And guess what happened? Our flight on the way home gets canceled. And then our flight the next morning is delayed. 
And he was like, and we almost had to like look for another flight. And we're on the way back, and he was like, man, I'm never flying with you ever again. So we're coming back from Minneapolis, and me and a friend are going to Vegas. And flight delay. Man, I'm never flying with you ever again. <laughs> so now I've had about three people tell me that they're never flying with me ever again, just based off of, you know, these, these continual flight delays and, and things like that. And so now I've started flying per convenience. So there's only certain airlines that I'll never use Frontier, I'll never use Spirit or anything like that. It's always American, United, Delta, or Southwest. But now I fly with whoever it seems like can get me there the fastest and whoever hubs like um, layovers are in the non-problematic airports. And so that's how I've started planning my travel versus, you know, loyalty to one airport or whatever the case may be. At first, it was man it was so disheartening like having continual issues after continual issues with flights that i literally almost started canceling all of my trips just because it was becoming such an inconvenience did any of the airlines do you right or do you like super right or like all kind of blanket no nope. blanket you always have to you always have to complain um i remember the first time dealing with southwest and i got stuck in st louis and i have you know multiple we're two exits away from the airport so there's multiple employees of southwest that frequent and just the airport in general that frequent our brewery and so i reached out to somebody to ask them to see what was going on with this delay she was telling me your flight's probably going to get canceled uh it's showing that uh, they don't have enough employees for the flight so flight ends up getting canceled and everybody's pissed because they delayed this flight like three three and a half hours before they decided just to go ahead and cancel them and now we're stuck here in St. Louis overnight. I'm not sleeping in the airport. But then I also know that if it's an employee concern or, or you know, issue with uh, you not having enough uh, flight attendants, that's, that's your problem. Mechanical issues, that's one thing, but that's your problem. So the lady, um, as I'm trying to talk to her, is basically telling me that I'm asked out, you know, you you're going to be stuck here overnight. No, ma'am, I'm not going to be stuck here overnight because I know for a fact that this was an employee issue. Well, I'm showing it's a mechanical issue, blah, blah, blah. Lady, you're full of shit. So mind you, again, uh, this is something that was funny because now I'm the angry black man. I'm in here getting loud. I'm in here getting upset. You have all these people behind me looking at me like I'm crazy, but am I in the wrong? No. So a manager comes 15, 20 minutes later, obviously, you know, they make me wait. Manager comes and he just tells me, man, you know what? You're completely right. Gives me a nice hotel room. Gives me $400 voucher. I'm sorry for the issues. Gotta, gotta, gotta. But the satisfaction was, was walking past all of those people laid up on the floor waiting for the flight the next day. <laughs> and see, you guys should have been as angry as I was instead of looking at me with such disdain. And now I get to sleep in a nice hotel room tonight while you guys sleep on this floor. So, I mean, it's been those type of issues that I've had continuously. I mean, I had to recently with American, I had to write them a, a corporate letter because I'm one of those people. Like, if I don't get my way, I'm writing the corporate letter and, you know, that type of thing. And finally, they took care of me. But, you know, it, it seems like these airlines are starting to care less and less and less about their customer base and, and making sure that everybody is situated. Yeah. I've been a United guy for almost the entire haul and I'm getting really close to having some lifetime status with them. And that's like my saving grace. It's like, yep. I, oh yeah. I, you got to hold on to something like that. You got to hold on to that golden ticket. Right. So that's the hope. Um, all right. So you said the word earlier and it was in my notes. So come on, let's talk about being a functioning introvert, right? I, I'm definitely a highly functioning one. You get thrust out in front of people. You got to do these things. But at the end of the day, you got to go find a closet, and climb into it, right? How do you recharge I had to the batteries? Do that three or four, I had to do that three or four times yesterday. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've, we've had the week of weather events going on all week. So last night we had a casino cocktail night. So everybody wanted to hang out. A couple of times you just got to go in the office and, and sit in there, you know, to yourself, shut the door. Um, I, I, I've noticed that quite a bit of brewers are kind of that functioning introvert, right? Where they can function with small groups and things like that. They have the friends, but when it comes to dealing with large groups, it becomes overwhelming. And it's, I think it has a part of it is because we work in a very close setting, right? I mean, you're on your brew floor. I, I find, 
I get very intimate with my my brewery floor, right? When I'm here by myself brewing, my headphones are in, I'm listening to my favorite music, I'm dancing, I'm vibing, I'm enjoying myself, right? That's your that's your time to yourself to create, that's your time to yourself to be an artist, that's your time to yourself to to do the things that you love. And so then you start bringing everybody around you, but then you forget all the extra details that go along with it. But for me, I've always been kind of an introvert. Like even in high school, I used to sit by myself at the lunch table and hang out with my friends and, and do my homework and eat to myself. Like I don't have a problem being alone. I'm one of those people that I enjoy the the overall, I have a joy of being alone. Just to have that silence to yourself is, is an amazing feeling, especially with two young children and, and a business to run. Um, and so for me, it becomes very overwhelming when we have large events and very overwhelming when I have to put in a lot of hours. And people, it, it's weird sometimes because, you know, people want to talk to the brewer and they want to talk to the owner and they want to get to know you and have those experiences and stuff like that. And you want to provide that to your customer base because it creates that that family vibe of people wanting to come back and support you and stuff like that. But on the other end of it, it's like sometimes I do not feel like talking. I just want to sit in my office with my headphones on and and work or close the, the brew deck and not have the door open during business hours and not have people ask me questions and just function and, and do what I need to do to, to get out the day. Um, it, it comes to point to where, I mean, even, you know, my significant other like knows after these events, like he needs time to reset, leave him alone. Uh, when I come back from trips, typically I need a day to like just digress and, and kind of like get better. Um, for me, what it is, is typically, um, uh, a Peloton ride or a treadmill run and then um, some exotic weed. And that typically puts me back kind of in the, the space of being able to function again. Uh, that's still but pressure I definitely, you, gotta be, you gotta be a dad too. I mean, that's, that's and that know, too. You know. And so, yeah, uh, one of the things that I've, I've had to start doing uh, is because of travel and different things like that, you know, I'm not always here for, for my kids, especially as much as I travel. Um, so one of the things that I've started is this podcast called Dad Work. And it basically, you know, it's a pop conglomerate of a whole bunch of fathers that have, have taken their time to be better dads. And just listening to that podcast and kind of implementing some of the things that they talk about um, have helped a lot. Like uh, dealing with my daughter, for instance, she started onboarding for kindergarten yesterday. And so you're, she's gone through this like phase to where she's been doing some unnecessary like fussing and crying to get their way type of thing. My kids are very spoiled. Uh, but, you know, if you can provide for them, you can provide for them. So my kids are spoiled. But in that sense, they do a lot of unnecessary fussing a lot of as I said, we're trying to get her out of that habit. And so dealing with her new kindergarten she's going from like a school where they could dress wear what they want to uniform they got to wear black shoes and, and different things like that and so it's like miara this is going to be one of those situations where you're going to have to have structure right you can't be in your fussing and stuff you're going to be getting in trouble but then i realized that that's not the way to go about it right you, know, you shouldn't bring negativity into it and so this morning we had to have a conversation and it was more along the lines of because the first day she didn't really interact with any other students or anything like that. Like, you know, kids that are here today or Brandon are going through the same, you know, anxiety and, you know, wondering where their other friends are, and their new teacher and, and different things like this. But you just got to give her the, the, you're a beautiful black girl talk and you're smart and, you know, people are going to want to be your friend. And, and she had an amazing day today. So it's, for me, it's been because I'm not around them as much as I feel like I need to be around them. When I am around them, I need to make it meaningful. So you travel too much, you work too hard, and you drink too much bourbon or beer or let's talk about bourbon real quick. Yeah, I've gotten out of the large consumption of beer. Um, 
I lost 25 pounds when I started doing the Peloton. And now uh, a half a pint just makes me feel full. I mean, it's not that I still don't enjoy beer, but I know where my calorie counts come from. And I think it's just my body telling me like, hey, you're going to kill this pint. You're going to add extra pound back. <laughs> so over the course of the last couple of years, I've definitely have gravitated more towards the, the bourbon uh, typical thing. Um, but for me, one of the things was I've never enjoyed the feeling of being drunk. I've never enjoyed the feeling of being tipsy. I do not like any changes to my body outside of being high off of weed. So for me, when it comes to drinking, it's more about the enjoyment of the actual flavor profile and the enjoyment of what I'm sipping, the camaraderie of who I'm around and not necessarily drinking to get drunk. Um, so for me, I typically have a one and a half ounce pour in the evening, um, depending on my mood. If there was something that uh, was accomplished that day, then I'll go into my uh, I have an office workout room. I have a fancy 45 year Remy barrel that has all my allocated, you know, rare fun stuff. And then in the kitchen where that's to the public, I have my bourbon cart. And that's all the, you know, Elijah Craig's, Jack Daniels, Buffalo Trail, and all the stuff that I don't mind sharing. Um, but, and that would be the everyday drinking thing. But for me, now, I, I, I typically don't drink that much. It's more so of, hey, I'm going to have this little one and a half ounce pour in my evening. Um, if it was something that something amazing happened in the, the day, like finding out I was in the, the greatest, you know, beer book, I had to pull out the uh, Thomas H. Handy for that. But, you know, it, it wasn't about getting drunk or anything. It was just about enjoying that moment more so than anything. So I just learned that you have a whole bourbon man cave, so that's good. And I've told you that that I've got a, a bourbon cave of my own. So oh, I'm, we've been, we've I'm ready to get you out here next time. I know. The next we've time I come visit, I'm ready. You already know. I'm ready. I your know. Office. Yeah, it's it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty sweet. Uh, I think this is a great point for us to jump out and call it a day. Um, you know, we've got work to do, and uh, sounds like it's a, a great opportunity. So I uh, wanted to let everybody know Marcus will be back on the next episode of this show. He'll be the host, and he has yet to name who he'll be uh, conversing with as the brewer of his choosing. Uh, the show will be on in about two weeks' time. Make sure you guys tune in for that. Uh, visit allaboutbeer.com and follow social media to support the journalism in the beer space. Check out patreon.com backslash allaboutbeer. I am Tommy Arthur of The Lost Abbey. That is Marcus Baskerville of Weathered Souls. Thanks for listening. Hope you guys had a good time. This episode was brought to you by First Tea. First Tea delivers the ingredients and experience brewers need for delicious beers and innovative flavors. Flexible order sizes and direct from farm teas for your next brew. Find out more about First Tea by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.firsttea.com.